know one question I want to make sure I get it right before I uh, check your answers. Otherwise, you'll get low scores and you'll complain the rest of the break. Hopefully, y'all will have high scores on your quiz. Was it too bad? Uh, some of the problems are easier than others. Most of them went right off of the labs. At this time, we're going to be talking about the periodic properties of the elements. This here is, as some people would put it, common sense. And others, as other people would put it, uh, kind of weird common sense. So, the things we need to know about the periodic properties of the elements. Okay, the first thing is quantum mechanics. It's got a large amount of material in it. Okay, we are, again, finished at covering the quantum mechanical theory, and we're going into how does this apply to the atoms. Our chemistry is the study of the atoms, and more specifically, the study of the electrons in the atoms. That's why the quantum mechanics is important, but it doesn't need to affect our grading based chemistry, or at least we don't see it. So, the electron configurations of cations and transition metals. When a cation is formed from an atom of a transition metal, the electrons are always removed from the ns orbital and then from the n minus 1 orbital. So, for transition metals, electron configuration, the s always goes first. Then the D. So iron, for example, iron has two different ion states, two plus and three plus. So if it loses the two from the S, it becomes two plus. If it loses two from the S and one from the D, it becomes three plus. Now a lot of people ask, well, why would it lose that one from the D? Well, D5 is half of D10. And for some reason, a half-filled D shell is more stable than a full uh, than a partially filled one. So the rule is, they want to be full, empty, or half-filled, and that usually guides why the ions form the way they do. Manganese, 4s2, 3d5. How many electrons could be lost for manganese? Okay, possibly seven. Which two do you think would go first? Okay, the two on the 4s. So manganese 3 plus looks like that. Yep, manganese has many oxidation states. Okay, this is just one of the, the main oxidation states of manganese is 2 plus. You know it can go up to 7 plus, right, from our experience. So those are also possible oxidation states. In general, the theory is they are most stable when it's empty or half filled. So this is the most stable ion of manganese. Not the only one, but the most stable one. Doesn't mean it always forms. There are reasons why it would not form because you've got to consider the electrons of other things that it's combining with. So you can't just consider it by itself. So that's why the rule can be extended further to uh, other, again, oxidation states, as we call them. If we look here at when the elements were discovered, uh, we can see some general patterns. First of all, we've got copper, silver, and gold all in this column, discovered in ancient times. Okay, the most recent ones are down near the bottom of the periodic table. Again, we have a range in here. The noble gases, all were discovered kind of in the middle section here. And these gases, the reason they were, they had such difficulty discovering them was because they were gases and you didn't, they did not react with the other elements. Mendeleev's original periodic table had blanks for number 68 and 72. He predicted that 68 would have a mass of about 68 AMU. The actual properties were 69.72 AMU. Low melting point, 29.8. Density, 5.9, 5.9. Formula of an oxide, X2O3, GA2O3. Formula of a chloride was XCl3, GaCl3. It was that pretty close. Yeah, he's close on most of those. And if you look here at germanium, he was almost right on the dot with germanium as well, especially the formula part, which was what he predicted. Properties and atomic number were what gave him, I'm sorry, properties and atomic mass were what gave him his periodic table. 
Um, and number one is actually like the grading to explain the patterns in the periodic table. Now, isoelectronic, we've talked about this. Every single element wants to become like a noble gas. So it wants to have the same electron configuration. That's called isoelectronic. Same electron configuration means it's stable if it is, again, a noble gas. So here we have magnesium, fluoride, sodium, neon, aluminum, oxygen, and nitrogen. Okay, their charges are determined by how many electrons they want to gain or lose to become like a noble gas. So nitrogen, why is it three minus? Nitrogen's right here. What's the name? One, two, three. You become like neon. Neon, why does it have a charge? Already a noble gas, more stable structure electronically. Magnesium is two plus. What does that mean? Two plus? One, whoop, two. Or two places back. That's a general pattern on the periodic table. All of the above species are part of the same isoelectronic series. That means they all want to become like neon in terms of the number of electrons. So fluorine gains one to become like neon. Sodium loses one to become like neon. Aluminum loses three. One, two, three to go back to neon. So all of them are isoelectronic with neon. If we look at the noble gas structures, here neon is helium's noble gas plus 2sp236. Oxygen with a 2 minus is helium, 2sp236. Aluminum is 2sp236. The same number of electrons are around each of these. Are they the same elements though? No, because aluminum, oxygen, and neon are different in the number of protons, positive protons in the nucleus. Now, periodicity is a predicting of the pattern that you see as you go across the periodic table. The rows on the periodic table are called periods. So the reactivity or the chemical properties repeat as you go across each row. Kind of like we have four periods here at Westview, one, two, three, four. Every day you go to one, two, three, four, or whatever your schedule says, and you repeat that periodicity pattern. Okay, every day at the end of the day, you're already here, unless you're sick, all right? So, this periodicity refers to the properties of the elements that repeat and are dependent on the location of the periodic table. These are predictable based on effective nuclear charge, atomic radius, ionic radius, ionization energy, electron affinity. So, these are five of the things we'll look at that are periodic in nature. That means they repeat. There's repeatability for each row of the periodic table, and there is predictability. So if we look at our noble gases here, all of our noble gases, the electron configuration for them, all have a completely filled orbital in that row. So this was in the first row, 1s2. This is 2s2, 2p6, and so on, all the way down from Nia to Xenon. The only thing that changes is the energy level. Okay. What happens to their size, atomic radius, as you go down? It gets bigger. And that's a general pattern. Atomic radius gets bigger as you go down the periodic table. Okay. This is called the first ionization energy. Which one has the greatest amount of energy to remove one electron? Helium does. That's because helium is the smallest. The positive nucleus is attracting those electrons. So it's harder to pull them away because the electrons are close to the nucleus. For xenon, these electrons are further away from the nucleus. Since they're further away distance-wise, there's not as much electrostatic attraction. And so it's easier to remove an electron. Now, it's still a lot of energy, but it's easier to remove an electron. What about boiling point? What happens as you go down in the noble gases? Okay, it goes up. So the question is, well, why does it go up? What's the difference between xenon and helium? Mass, and it might be bigger in size, volume. What's one other thing that's different between the two? Number of protons. What else? Number of electrons. Scientists have seen that most people say this is because of mass. That's about 40% true. It's not because of mass that they stick together. Boiling point, that means that at 4.2 Kelvin, 
this can be a liquid. If you raise it, or it's 4.0 Kelvin. 4.2 Kelvin, this becomes a gas. The reason why is there's only two electrons from each helium able to attract to the other nucleus. The electrons can attract to the other nucleus, the other protons, and that attraction allows them to stick together. The problem is there's only two electrons. When you have lots of electrons, as in xenon, there's a really cool thing that happens. It causes them to stick together. Xenon. Looking at the periodic table, xenon has 54 electrons. So it's got a nucleus and it's got 54 electrons. It's got a 54 positive in here. You've got another one of these, 54 electrons. It's got a positive in here. Okay. Now, why would it be beneficial to have so many electrons? We only have two electrons, but the atoms are closer, the distance is smaller. But here, what happens is, if I had 54 electrons and they all happen to be on this side at one instant, this side would be slightly negative. And this side would be slightly what? Slightly positive. If the same thing happened at the exact same time, if this was slightly positive, it would attract the what of this xenon? The negative, the electrons. Now, it's not going to happen that you get all 54 on one side at one time. Again, this is a little bit of an exaggeration. But you can see that this side will be slightly negative. This will be slightly positive. They have an attraction between each other. And this attraction is what allows xenon to be a liquid at 165.1 Kelvin, which still isn't that warm. But it goes up quite a bit. This here is an intermolecular attraction. Okay, this is also called an induced dipole. We'll cover this in more detail as we go. But electrons, the number of electrons, the more electrons you have to move around, the better chance you can have a disproportionate amount. And when one becomes slightly negative and positive, that affects the other one. And they stick together because of that slight negative and positive charge. Density of gas, what do you notice from the density for these? As you go down, what happens? Goes up. Okay. Now, the volume of xenon is bigger than the volume of helium. So why does the density go up then? And mass. You've got to consider mass. So density is dealing with mass. Most people think this is dealing with mass. Okay. Mass plays a role, but it does not play enough of a role for why they are, again, why the boiling point is higher for this than this here. Now, the first thing to look at, though, is we were talking about the positive nucleus. This is called the effective nuclear charge, called abbreviated GF. This is the positive charge from the nucleus felt by an electron. So how the, uh, they are attracted, that positive charge. So if you look here at a nucleus, lithium nucleus, it's got three electrons. This electron that is outside of the nucleus and outside of the original 1s cloud experiences a net charge of about plus one. If it's inside of the cloud, it experiences a charge of three plus. Where are they coming from? Where are they coming from? Yeah, sorry. Ah, this net charge, I'll explain where this is calculated from. It's called the Z sub F. Uh, two plus is uh, helium. Three plus is lithium. It's got three positive protons, three electrons. So this is an example using lithium. So this is a Bohr model of lithium showing a cloud here. Okay. This one here is uh, a shielding because you can see the 1s cloud here shields this electron from experiencing the full positive power of the nucleus. This one, when it's inside of the shield, it experiences a positive three, a three positive charge on this electron and that one and that one. So this is a shielding that will affect the positive charge experienced by the nucleus. ZF is the result of opposing forces. So we've got the nucleus, we've got attraction between all of the electrons in the nucleus, right? They're all being attracted. But the outer electrons are being repelled by the inner electrons. The inner electrons have a negative charge. The outer electrons have a negative charge. Like charges repel, and the negative-negative repels some. 
since it repels some, it cancels mm. out some of the attraction of the nucleus. So that is what happens with shielding. You don't have as much charge on those outer electrons, not, a mu not as much attraction to the nucleus. As the ZF increases, the electrons will experience greater attraction to the nucleus. So as you have a larger difference, you'll have a greater attraction to the nucleus. So how do we find the ZF? The ZF is just the number of protons minus the number of electrons in the nuclear shield. So the number of protons minus the number of electrons in the nuclear shield. We use this to estimate the Gehr element. It is one of the foundational things. It's easy to calculate, and it's easy to compare. So here's an example, neon. We look at neon, we look at its shells. These are the ones that are shielded. These are the ones on the very outside, the 2p6. So those are the shielded electrons. And these here are the outermost electrons. There are four electrons in the shield, and there are 10 protons in neon, because it's the 10th element. So what we do is we take the 10 protons and subtract the four electrons, and that gives us a charge of what? Six positive. That positive six charge is called the ZF4 neon. So it has a very high positive six charge on the nucleus. Fluorine here, so if we look at fluorine, it's got the shielded electrons and the outermost electrons. Calculate the ZF, you take nine minus four. So this has a positive five Z effective force. Okay? So the ZF is positive five per fluorine. Now, if you look at the elements here, there is a pattern for their effective nuclear charges. Hydrogen here has a charge of one, then helium is two. You go up, 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 neon is very large, but sodium is down low again, okay? So as you can see, the nuclear charge is the greatest for the noble gases in each row. Okay? That's why they keep the, new, the electrons on the outside to themselves. Which elements would give up the electrons the best? The alkali metals. Okay? So as you can see, this is due to the, the ZF factor. Okay? Fluorine here would love to gain one electron. Okay? If it gained one electron, again, it would be more stable like neon. But the ZF, the effective nuclear charge, is what we're going to look at in more detail tomorrow. So we'll see you tomorrow.